Good morning and welcome back. You're watching World Talks here on TVP World. I'm Sarya Stremska. As Ukraine continues to fight off the Russian invaders, a few key developments have emerged in recent weeks. North Korea has joined the conflict by supplying Russia with manpower. Ukraine has announced it is looking to mobilize further 160,000 people to join the war effort. Russia is starting to visibly struggle economically, as evidenced by soaring prices of some food items, such as butter. U.S. presidential elections are kicking off in 48 hours and are said to have a profound impact on Ukraine. To discuss these developments, I am joined here this morning by Sergei Sumlenny, Director, European Resilience Initiative Centre. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Much appreciated. Good morning and thank you for having me today. So let's start with these North Korean troops. How significant their presence uh, on the front lines is? Well, um, the presence of the North Korean troops, of course, cannot be a game changer. It's nothing can be a game changer in this war. But it provides Russia with a um, certain advantage on certain parts of the front line. And that is important. Um, as now we uh, have that, uh, we, we witness that Russia tries to change the uh, more or less balance which, have, um, which has happened last uh, months and create more pressure on Ukrainian troops using the uh, momentum and using the situation that Ukraine suffers massive lack of manpower. Uh, that is the largest. Like, Ukraine has practically two problems. One is the lack of uh, manpower, and the second is the lack of long-range strike capacity. So Russia tries to increase this advantage of um, having more manpower on the ground, independently on what quality they are, just have more soldiers on a certain, on a particular kilometer or 10 kilometers of the front line. And for that, uh, 10,000 North Korean troops is absolutely enough. It's not about how good they are. It's not about how motivated they are. It's not about how skilled they are. It's about just to have 10,000 more soldiers on a particular, like, 200 kilometers of the front line. Uh, right. Uh, but, I mean, to address this lack of manpower, uh, Ukraine is planning to mobilize further 160,000 people. I mean, is that even possible in terms of uh, scale, in terms of how many people are already in the army? Uh, that's a tricky question, because, um, of course, Ukraine has manpower, or uh, able men, who are not mobilized yet and who could serve in the army. The problem is uh, how motivated they are. And here we need to uh, divide two things. The motivation of a civilian to do something for the victory and uh, the uh, belief of this civilian, uh, if it is important to continue this war and to win this war, is it possible to win this war? And here the Ukrainian society demonstrates um, still very strong resilience after uh, almost three years of a full-scale war. And on another hand, if this particular civilian is ready to go to the army and be a military person and to fight in the trenches in the worst case. And uh, here the situation is different because uh, of, of the lack of uh, success, uh, military success uh, from the Ukrainian side uh, and what success can be seen through the eyes of the civilians because the fact that Ukrainian army was managed to hold the whole Russian troops for almost three years is not seen as success by the civilians anymore. It was seen in the year 22 as the Russian army was stopped and it was seen as success, but not now already. So um, the lack of offensive operations, the lack of some massive uh, hits on the Russian territory, um, is damages massively uh, the willingness of civilians to go to the army. And here one must uh, talk about the, uh, about the role of the Western allies, first of all, uh, Germany and the US, as a very slow process of providing Ukraine with troops, uh, with, sorry, with arms. And very slow process of sending already committed arms. Like we know from the recent reports from Pentagon that only 10% of um, the equipment which recently has been promised to Ukraine has really been delivered. And this all leads to a situation when the army is under equipped, when there is no 
significant success on the front line and which demotivates our people because everyone or almost everyone is ready to join the army when the army is inoffensive and liberates one Ukrainian city after another. But very few are ready to go to the army for indefinite time for maybe one, two years and live in trenches uh, under Russian bombardments. All right, and you've mentioned these uh, delays in deliveries of weapons. So what are they stemming from? Is it the lack of will or are there some procedural obstacles? I'm afraid that there are two reasons for that. And uh, first is that uh, there is no common goal between the Western allies and Ukraine. Uh, many Western politicians see this goal. The goal of this uh, war is to be stopped. And they don't want, of course, Ukraine to fail, but they also don't want Ukraine to win too much. And uh, the, the, the least thing which they wish is a military defeat, fast military defeat of Russia, which can lead to Russia's collapse. And that is what they fear more than a collapse of Ukraine. Uh, despite the fact that they don't wish the collapse of Ukraine, they think that collapse of Ukraine would be a lesser evil than collapse of Russia. And they don't believe in collapse of Ukraine. They can say, OK, maybe Ukraine will lose something, but not totally disappear. So it's fine for them. That's the problem number one. The problem number two is that the and that goes from the problem number one or it, it impacts the problem number one. Uh, many Western capitals like Berlin or Washington don't see this war as something what directly impacts their security. So from the point of view of uh, Chancellor Scholz or President Biden, or especially his um, security advisor, um, Jake Sullivan, um, obviously uh, even the worst case scenario for Ukraine would remain a localized scenario, which I believe is utterly wrong, because Vladimir Putin and Russia's plans are very clear. They want to expand further. They will continue, of course, to undermine us, and it will be encouragement for uh, other dictators to test the limits. So in, from this perspective, um, many Western politicians believe that uh, there is nothing wrong in not going all in into this war, and quite the opposite, going all in would increase the danger, because this would, from their point of view, provoke Russia for some reckless steps. I don't know what can be more reckless than threat with nuclear strikes um, practically on a daily basis and um, daily bombardment of the largest nation in uh, Europe, quite in the border to you, including hits on um, the EU and NATO territory. But that is their view, and that leads to the current situation. Uh, right, and you've mentioned a, a collapse of Russia. I mean, that's something that, that people are uh, fearing. But then again, of course, um, something that nations were aiming for with all these sanctions. And it seems that the sanctions are finally uh, delivering some results because uh, the predicted inflation uh, in Russia is at 8 to 8.5 percent. So, I mean, that's... Um, so, so what are we expecting? What will be stemming from this? We see Russia cooperating with new countries such as the UAE and Turkey for, for more imports. What kind of dynamic are you foreseeing here? Well, it is a very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, first, yes, uh, Russia's economy is weaker uh, than uh, we tend to think. Of course, Russia has managed to create a wartime economy. Of course, Russia had uh, got time also by these delays in um, the weapons deliveries to Ukraine, but Russia has got time to create new alliances. But Russia's economy is tumbling. Um, interest rate has been recently raised uh, um, up to 21 percent points. Um, so that is, uh, I think, one of the highest in the world. Uh, nothing among uh, developed countries uh, of this kind has been seen recently. And um, yes, and uh, Russia has also lack of manpower. Russia has lack of technologies. Russia has lack of resources, etc. The problem is that uh, as Russia is an autocracy, they can uh, suppress their population and they can up to a certain uh, level of uh, negative development. They can keep the situation under control. What Ukraine cannot because Ukraine is a democracy and Ukraine has a smaller scale and Ukraine is lacking two uh, important types of weaponry which are important for such war of attrition. Long range strikes, uh, capacities like cruise missiles and uh, aviation like Ukraine is practically lacking air force. Now, regarding to the West, yes, the sanctions are working, but by far not as much as we hope. 
also the European Union doesn't prosecute uh, EU companies who sell uh, weapons through neighboring countries like Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, Kazakhstan and others. And we know that e export to these countries from European countries, including Germany, has um, skyrocketed uh, by 20 or 30 times after the uh, start of the full-scale invasion. That means all these, all these deliveries go just through the neighboring countries, the technology deliveries, and these technology components, they are also for Russian missiles and Russian military production. And once again, um, the, the uh, maximum brave goal of the West is the change of Russia's regime, the removal of Vladimir Putin. And even this perspective is seen with some sort of fear because, oh, we don't know who comes after Putin. Maybe he will be worse. Maybe there will be sort of havoc. Maybe there will be a person who is more reckless than Putin. And uh, what goes beyond this point, like a military defeat, demilitarization of Russia, creating of a uh, demilitarized zone, or even uh, a chance for some occupied nations of uh, Russia, to um, start speaking about their um, independence or self-determination, uh, you name it, uh, is absolutely out of discussion in the uh, back uh, rooms uh, in Berlin or Washington. And speaking of Washington, uh, the final stage of American presidential elections is around the corner. It will happen in about 48 hours. So uh, my question uh, for you is, how is Ukraine preparing itself for a possible outcome that would not be favorable to the country? And I mean, for the country, I mean, of course, uh, Republicans winning here. Well, uh, I think that Ukrainians prepare to each outcome. We know it is a very uh, tight battle and we cannot be sure who will be the next president. But from the point of view of, of the Ukrainians, uh, it is um, a perspective of a bad scenario and a potentially catastrophic scenario, but not guaranteed. Um, it is important to understand that from the Ukrainian point of view, our uh, Mm, win or like victory of Kamala Harris is not a good scenario. Uh, it is, uh, of course, from a certain perspective, better than the victory of Trump. But uh, the Ukrainians say, um, well, um, if Kamala Harris continues more or less, uh, the policy of President Biden and uh, previous Democratic President Barack Obama, it will be the same uh, delivering uh, too, a few weapons too late and trying to trying to set some sort of deals for the future Russia, which we see from the Biden administration. Yes, the U.S. is the largest supporter of Ukraine uh, in military means. Yes, the U.S. is a very important supplier of Ukraine. But the U.S. could have done much more and deliberately has not done uh, as much as the U.S. could have done out of fear of collapse of Russia. From that perspective, many in Ukraine look at potential President Trump trying to ignore his um, connections or connections of his team with Russia. And I need to stress this is the sign of how much the Ukrainians are disappointed in Biden's policy, in Biden's policy that they look at Trump and say, yes, he can be dangerous but he can also be a sort of a chance for Ukraine because he's reckless, because maybe one day Putin insults him and Trump would retaliate. And of course, this is uh, like setting all money in casino on uh, zero, hoping to solve all your financial problems. That is uh, a sign of desperation. But that is how it is um, seen from Ukraine and the Ukrainians say we do not in intervene into any uh, development because we have uh, we have very bad experience in uh, dealing with the uh, elections and we just wait who win and we will deal with the person who wins. Right, but on the other side we have uh, VP candidate J.D. Vance who is saying cut off funding for Ukraine completely, right? So this is, uh, this is a pretty uh, big gamble here. Sergei Sumlen, Absolutely. I think. Absolutely. And he said he said a month ago that Trump is a new Hitler. So he changed his mind as well. Right. So I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. Sergei Sumlende, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Much appreciated. And thank you for watching World Talks. Please stay tuned for more here on TPP World.